There's other types of signal transduction pathway receptors other than the seven transmembrane alpha helix. That's just the one that we talked about first. And the way that I've classified these two is there's the ones that are going to recruit tyrosine kinases and then the ones that are tyrosine kinases. And so even though they're both structurally kind of different, at the end of the day, they're both doing very similar processes here. So they have really similar functions, right? They're both involved in the activation of tyrosine kinases. And so I'm going to go ahead and talk to the middle here about the things that they have in common. So what they have in common is unlike with the seven transmembrane alpha helixes, these are about changes in quaternary level protein structure. Both of these guys are involved in dimerization upon ligand binding. And this dimerization in both instances is going to result in cross-phosphorylation of tyrosine kinases. In both of these contexts, tyrosine kinases, which are kinase enzymes that phosphorylate at the tyrosine residues, play a role in both cell division and cell proliferation and cell maturation. All right, so that's a lot, right? So let's just review. Changes in the quaternary level structure is the phenomenon that we're having here. We're talking about dimerization upon ligand binding to the receptor site. This dimerization is going to result in the cross-phosphorylation of the tyrosine kinases, and tyrosine kinases are going to play roles ultimately in many processes, but to list a few is cell division and cell differentiation. Um, one of the first ever ways that we were ever discover mechanisms of cancer was based off of tyrosine kinases. So all of these guys are connected by... And so I'm only going to have time to really talk about two examples for each of these, but for the first one here, um, what this does is in this context of the dimerization and things like that, with the specific commonly type of tyrosine kinases are known as jack kinases, and that's just kind of a, uh, <laughs> a name that biologists gave it because they thought they were being funny. But it's short for Janus kinases, and Janus would be the two-faced Roman god um, because he was like a two-faced because it's two-sided. And so that's what we talk about with Jack. In this context, we're going to say Jack 2, but there's also like Jack 3 and things like that that are going to be involved in this. For an example of what this would be, uh, well, human growth hormone would be involved in this. So if you're that guy who thinks he can go to the store and buy himself some human growth hormone, you should know that human growth hormone is a soluble protein and it's going to be denatured in your stomach. <laughs> it's, it's not going to, to do anything. It's not going to be absorbed systemically, especially if you're buying it in a, <laughs> a supplement pill that says proprietary blend is the main ingredient. So for the ones that are tyrosine kinases, uh, just like we said over here, this dimerization ligand upon uh, ligand binding results in cross-phosphorylation. Uh, the two examples that I'm going to say is that this is going to result in the activation. I guess just two examples that we're going to say. So the insulin receptor would be an example of that, and then the epidermal growth factor. And I'm going to talk about each and every one of these in a second. I wanted to mention for receptors that uh, are known that actually act as tyrosine kinases or abbreviated as RTKs, which is receptors with tyrosine kinase domains, are both the insulin receptors and the epidermal growth factor receptors. So in case this wasn't obvious from the previous one that we talked about, tyrosine kinases play a lot of roles in a lot of processes from growth, like we said here, to overall metabolic processes. So for the epidermal growth factor, if we were to just kind of, I guess, draw this bottom area here, I'll use that as my uh, phospholipid bilayer area. If I could fit that down there, probably need to leave myself a little bit more room than that. But oh well. Anyways, so on the uh, surface of our cells, we have epidermal growth factor receptors. And whenever the ligand binds to that, in this context, the epidermal growth factor, that's going to result in receptor dimerization, uh, cross-phosphorylation, which is going to activate the kinase domains of them, which in this context is going to result in phosphorylation at a, a mediator protein, not necessarily a mediator protein, sorry, but an adapter protein, which ultimately results in the process of mediation, known as GRB2. So here's our my wonderful drawing of a <laughs> epidermal growth factor receptor upon ligand binding here. 
Uh, I'll do that in gold actually because I think that's the color I was using up there. So whenever the epidermal growth factor, or whatever it is that binds here, this is going to result in a conformational changes, which is going to cause dimerization, which is going to result in cross phosphorylation of the tyrosine domains. And I'm just going to draw it in one here. If I phosphorylation here, which is going to, in this context, phosphorylation activates the kinase enzymes. Now these guys are going to also be actively phosphorylating other proteins and for example GRB2 would be one that's going to be phosphorylated. Like I said earlier GRB2 is an adapter protein and what an adapter protein is in this context or at least in the context of the signal transduction pathway this is a protein that facilitates or mediates protein-protein interactions but isn't an enzyme itself. So once we phosphorylate the adapter protein GRB2, this is going to make GRB2 undergo a conformational change, which is going to ultimately activate a protein known as SOS. SOS has a really unique feature in that it's called a GEF, which stands for guanosine nucleotide exchange factor, which sounds exactly <laughs> what it sounds like. We're going to take GDP out of something and we're going to put in GTP. GDP out of something, not the SOS molecule, but something else, and we're going to be adding in GTP. SOS is ultimately going through the use of its GEF, it's going to cause a conformational change, which is going to activate something known as ROS. And we've talked about ROS, I think, in my immunology videos, but ROS is really, uh, at least I can say that it's analogous, I'm not sure if it's homologous, to the G protein alpha subunit. So just to stick with my really bad drawings here, I have ROS here. If I said that it was similar to the G protein alpha subunit, it has GDP bound to it. Whenever it reacts with SOS, it's going to result in ROS that has GTP bound to it. I know I changed colors midway. Probably shouldn't have done that. But anyways, through the use of a GEF, in this context, SOS. So ROS is a really small monomeric protein Right? It's not a heterotrimer like we saw with the G protein. Um, and then it has the active and then the inactive form. In the inactive form, it's going to be bound to GDP. And in the active form, it's going to obviously be, well, bound to GTP. And ROS plays a role in so many processes and so many other cascade events that I, I really don't have time to talk about it. And you're just going to have to take my word for it. But one of the things we could also say about it is that the active form of this is a GTPase activity. So I would say that this is similar to the G alpha subunit. GTPase activity, yes. Um, just like with the G alpha subunit, this reaction is extremely slow. But unlike with the G alpha subunit, which was just this like intrinsic thing here, the GTPase of ROS can have proteins that can come in and can increase its catalytic rate. So we call these GAP, which stands for GTPase activator proteins. So GAP can come in and they can help with the extremely slow GTPase rate of ROS. So that's a lot to talk about. But as long as you understand that it's a long series of events that results in um, activation of a GTPase enzyme here, that's going to cleave that, that's going to stop it. It's very similar to what we saw with the G protein. The only difference is that ROS takes place one far later on down in a cascade, but also has other proteins that can act on it and modify its rate. Okay, so now let's move on to insulin. For insulin, the identity of the receptor is kind of unique. The insulin receptor consists of an alpha subunit and a beta subunit. And what's interesting to me is that this is connected by a disulfide bridge, which you really don't see that happening a lot, uh, especially with membrane-bound receptors. The alpha subunit is the site of ligand binding. Ligand is going to bind to the alpha subunit, whereas the beta subunit is the actual tyrosine kinase. Just like we had talked about earlier, we've already had <laughs> binding of the ligand to the receptor, which results in dimerization, which results in cross-phosphorylation of our tyrosine domains, which is going to result in this context of activation. So we're in this, just like before, we had phosphorylation of an adapter protein. Well, guess what? We're going to do the same thing here. We're going to result in phosphorylation of an adapter protein. But the adapter protein for this is known as IRS, which stands for insulin receptor subunit. Just like before, it's an adapter protein. It's not an enzyme. It's just going to mediate protein-protein interactions. And I guess if I were to attempt to draw this down here, and there's a lot of better pictures in the book, but the top part here, this is the alpha subunit, and at the bottom part here, is the, to, all the way down to the cytoplasmic domain, we have the beta subunit. 
uh, ligand binding is going to cause a conformational changes, which is going to result in diamerization and ultimately cross phosphorylation, just like we had before. And then when, when tyrosine kinases get phosphorylated, that's what activates them. So they're going to go ahead and start immediately phosphorylating IRS. So once IRS gets phosphorylated, um, many times over actually, it's going to result in a conformational change or the act that's ultimately results in the activation of something known as PK3, which stands for uh, phosphoinositol 3 kinase, which I'm just going to abbreviate that as PK3. So PK3 um, is a lipid kinase. And what's interesting to me about that is the fact that kinases do so much that they're not just restricted to, to being able to, to think about that, being reactive with both proteins, um, ADP and ATP, and also lipids as well. That's an extremely wide uh, range of classification that we have here, an extremely wide range of, of functions that we have here. But anyways, for PK3, what this is going to do, this is going to take PIP2, okay, from, from which we had talked about earlier. And it's going to do just that. It's going to add a phosphate group to PIP2. So if PIP2 now has another phosphate group, well, guess what it has? We call it PIP3. And obviously, we're doing this at the expense. So you have PIP2 going in, if you think about it, and then PIP3 coming out. PK3 with PIP2 coming in, and what comes out of PK3 is PIP3. I know it's getting messy down there, but anyways. <laughs> PIP3, on the other hand, is going to keep traveling along. Because remember, PIP3 is, is an insoluble membrane-bound compound. So it's going to ultimately come down here, downstream, and activate something known as PIP3-dependent protein kinase. PIP3-dependent protein kinase, so PDK3 stands for. Which, if it's a protein kinase, I think you can imagine what it's going to do. It's going to phosphorylate things. And in this context, it phosphorylates something known as AKT. AKT is sometimes also known as protein kinase B, but protein kinase B, or in this case AKT, is the only one of these entire cascade here that is not membrane bound and is actually soluble to diffuse away and to, to do other things. I'm just going to make a special note here that it is soluble, whereas everything else we've talked about thus far is not soluble. And it's going to diffuse away and it's going to phosphorylate many other sites. And ultimately, in this context, it's going to, since we're talking about insulin, it's going to result in the glucose transporter being produced and embedded in the cell membrane so that glucose can passively flow down its concentration gradient and into the cell. So the last things that I wanted to mention would be just the individual sites of amplification that we have here that result in this cascade here. So the first site of amplification is the phosphorylation of IRS. I know I've drawn these as linear things here, but it's actually doing this to many different molecules at once. Then we have the action of PIP2 coming in and to be acted upon by PK3 to form PIP3. So this would be another site of, and then PIP3 dependent kinases as well is its action of, of phosphorylating protein kinase B, or AKT, is another site of amplification. And one of the things that's really amazing to me is that when you start to think about things like diabetes, you know, it's a type 2 diabetes specifically, more so than type 1, is a long amount of, of damage is done to, I think it's 800 some odd proteins. And the reason that that damage is brought about by exposure to it, by exposure to insulin, in this context sugar exposure, is because ultimately if you keep activating this site, you do result in desensitization to insulin, which you shouldn't be. <laughs> you shouldn't develop a tolerance for that. That's one of those essential things. But anyways, that's how that works.